Welcome back, everyone. It's December 1st, 2020. We've made it to December, both in terms of the course, but in terms of the pandemic. I have to say, as I was reflecting on this final week of the course, I don't think even in September, I would have expected how dire and grim this time would be in relationship to the pandemic with numbers doubling, with hospitalizations, um, getting to close to 100,000 and certainly will surpass that. And with many unanticipated and unnecessary deaths. And as we look at the pandemic, um, we have to, at this point, come to some conclusion that the measures that we have applied, especially here in the United States, but in other places, have generally failed. These are principally public health measures that required changes in behaviors, mandates around closing businesses and schools. And, and right now, the pandemic seems very much out of control. Nonetheless, there's a lot of hope. And as I followed the news over the Thanksgiving weekend, um, there's much to make us expect that 2021 will be a better year and that the pandemic may come under substantial control, especially through vaccines. And we're gonna have a poll in a minute about vaccines and where we stand. I guess I just wanted to say that I think we've all reached a point where we have, we know people or we care about people or people in our families and some of us have become sick and many have been lost. And there's a need, I think, to acknowledge that as we've studied this, we've, always, we've also experienced it. And many of us are experiencing loss. I think almost all of us are experiencing forms of fatigue. And that's especially difficult as we face this next period. But as I say, I listen to a lot of people. I think some of their hopes may be aspirational and expansive, but vaccines will make a difference. It raises this larger question of what we can accomplish through some traditional public health measures of education, information, behavioral change, and where biomedicine sits within a larger framework of controlling pandemics. Um, on Thursday, Ingrid and I will look back at this last year with you and look ahead to think about what impacts the pandemic has had socially, culturally, politically, medically, um, with a sense of what can we expect as we look ahead, especially in this shorter or intermediate future. One of the things we're gonna do on Thursday is talk about what we think of as key words, words that kind of anchor or explain or symbolically account for aspects of the pandemic. So we'll be sending you a Google Doc for you to select four key words, words that you think attract meaning and significance around the problem of the epidemic. Um, so look for that in your in your email. I also wanted to let everybody know that the Q guide is up and available. And just to let you know how important your assessment, evaluation, ideas of the strengths and weaknesses of the course will be to us moving forward. So I really want to encourage everyone to check in and fill out your um, Q guide form. Today we're going to take up the question of misinformation. And yesterday I was listening to a podcast um, by a COVID podcaster, Andy Slavitt, and his guest was Ashish Jha, who recently left Harvard to become the Dean of the Brown School of Public Health. And Dean Jha had testified last week before a Senate committee on hydroxychloroquine. And he was the one Democratic invited um, speaker, and there were three other physicians there 
all of whom were invited by the Republican leadership and all of whom were absolutely convinced that hydroxychloroquine is an effective, life-saving, epidemic-ending drug for COVID-19. And Dean Jha, somebody who believes in science, randomized clinical trials, the data, and very sophisticated. You've probably seen him on CNN all the time talking about COVID. He's been a go-to leader. And what struck me about the interview with him was how shocked he was to be confronted by three people who absolutely believe this. They had no significant financial interest in hydroxychloroquine. They questioned his credentials and his thinking on it, even though he had volumes of research and science behind the idea that hydroxychloroquine does not benefit patients who have COVID-19. And I just wanted to mention that anecdote because we are living in a world of incredibly contentious, divided perspectives on science, on truth, on public health, on politics. And as Ingrid and I thought about this second to last class, we felt it was crucial to have some experts, some guest faculty come and more deeply inform us about this world of conspiracy theories, misinformation, science denial, and the notion that we live in echo chambers that are increasingly disconnected from one another. So now I just want to ask Ingrid to introduce our guest speakers. Thank you, Alan. We have such a tremendous uh, group today. And I think that this is really um, our, our, such a privilege, especially in this second to last class and really our last class with guests to have these three esteemed speakers. Um, I think one of the critical pieces that Alan and I have hoped to incorporate into this moment with you all is the cross-disciplinary nature of this work. That all of these people and these three speakers today really represent and embody this. They all have come from different disciplines. They work on areas that are distinct from one another. And yet this topic of misinformation has been consistently critical to conversations that they've been part of scholarly work that they're leading. And now, particularly in the context of COVID, um, I think it's really, it, it speaks to the unifying nature of this moment. And I hope that we have been able to share that with you across our class this semester. So um, let me introduce these three wonderful speakers for you all. Our first speaker today is Dr. Joan Donovan. She is the research director of the Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. And she's really a leader in the field of examining internet and technology, as well as online um, media manipulation and disinformation campaigns. And she has spoken extensively about the impact of misinformation and has even testified as of, um, I believe, October in front of the house on this topic. And so she's really a leader. She's been working in this space for a long time, but obviously this moment with COVID has really accelerated the scholarship. And I think in some ways has brought a lot of other people on board um, with her now in terms of really focusing our attention here. So we're really excited to hear from her today, particularly on these topics and, and her recent testimony. Our uh, second speaker today is Professor Yochai Benkler. Um, he is the Berkman Professor of Entrepreneurial Legal Studies at Harvard Law School and faculty co-director of the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society at Harvard. And really, it, since the early 1990s, he's played a role in, in characterizing information, um, communication, and collaboration and innovation in this space. And I think in this particular moment, he's really been a leader and has a working paper out, I believe it's still a working paper, um, on how President Donald Trump 
has harnessed really what we would consider traditional mass media as the primary vector for disinformation, particularly in the context of what has recently occurred with this election. And so we're really excited to hear from him today about some of these other larger factors that have been at play, particularly within the context of the legal system and how it will help inform what we think about disinformation, particularly in the media ecosystem. So we're thrilled to get to hear from him today. And then our third um, wonderful speaker is Dr. K. Vish Viswanathan, who is the Lee Kum Kee Professor of Health Communications in the Department of Social and Behavioral Sciences at the Chan School for Public Health and in the McGraw-Patterson Center for Population Sciences at the Farber. And his area of expertise is in the communication sector, particularly drawing from literature in the communication sciences, social epidemiology, and social and health behavior sciences, and really the translation of knowledge to, um, to mass audiences. And he has spoken in multiple forums on the impact of social media, particularly in this moment in terms of dissemination of misinformation. And his lab, if you go online, you can see it there, created the COVID-19 dashboard, which is really focused on promoting credible COVID-19 related information that's easy to access. And I know as a physician myself, a lot of people have asked me, where can I go to get the right information? And I think um, a dashboard like this is really critical in helping distill down the channels of information for people to access. So we're thrilled to get to hear from him today. So um, on that note, I will hand it over to our first speaker today, Dr. Donovan. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's really a, an amazing feat to see this class having come together. And um, we aim to please here. So I'm just going to kind of give you a deluge of information, and then we can sort it out uh, through Q&A. Um, I have been working uh, in uh, medical sociology for over a decade. Um, but most people know me for the kind of research that I've been doing related to online communities, uh, especially communities of extremists and fringe groups who really try to hide basically who they are or what their intentions are in order to spread their political platform or propaganda. Um, and so in looking at the my cross interests now, which is medical sociology and media manipulation, I'm really drawn into how do we understand this moment, given that there's all these different ways that people are going to try to trick you into believing certain things uh, about the COVID, about the pandemic, about uh, sort of geopolitical relations, uh, as well as domestic issues. And this is all happening in real time as we're trying to navigate an election and um, as well as the census. The census also happened this year. And so there's a lot of misinformation out there that uh, seems to cross over. So one of the things that my team has tried to do is create a framework or a rubric for understanding this. What I will point you to is to go to mediamanipulation.org, um, which is our new website. And on that website, we have a bunch of case studies, three of which deal specifically with medical misinformation related to COVID-19. And on this website, what we've really tried to do is bring together a theory methods package for how you would understand media manipulation in this moment, where we really try to track five essential points of action, which is where does the campaign begin? Uh, how does it move across the web and platforms and media and the news? Then we look at who responds, because most media manipulation campaigns don't really take hold of the public imagination unless someone important responds to it. In, in particular, someone like uh, a politician or a journalist or even now public health professionals. And so, yeah, if you click on methods, it'll show you this uh, cool chart that if you scroll down a little bit, um, this is our life cycle. And so uh, then we look at the mitigation by different platform companies. Like, what are they actually doing? Right? Are they taking down content? Are they, remo are they removing users? Are they uh, labeling things? We've seen an, an immense amount of labeling happening. 
And then we're looking at how do media manipulators actually adjust to the situation? So in the context of COVID, when we're mapping this life cycle, what we're trying to understand is essentially what kinds of narratives about vaccines are taking hold in public discussion? Who is driving them? Are they hiding who they are? or Are they hiding what their intents are? How are they uh, trading up the chain or moving into more public conversation by getting picked up by the news or uh, getting picked up by a journalist who's just trying to get, you know, a story out there? Um, and so one of the research reports that we did, and I'll link it in the chat, is one about COVID uh, misinformation, specifically targeting Black communities. And we released this uh, earlier this summer. Um, it's underneath the research tab um, at the top. Um, and then if you scroll down a bit, that's called the Canaries in the Coal Mine Report. And essentially this report is uh, written by Brandy Collins Dexter, who's been a fellow of ours for a year and a half now. And the idea is pretty simple, which is we, try, we tried to isolate four major myths about COVID-19 online. So uh, what we found is that there were four major misconceptions that were circulating at a very high volume, which is important to understand because what we're dealing with is misinformation at scale. Uh, of course, communities for a very long time have had uh, issues related to rumors and, you know, uh, reputational politics about certain health agencies. What we're trying to look at is really what is new about what's happening online. So rampant rumors about Black people not being able to die from COVID-19 or that they were somehow immune that the virus was man-made for the purposes of population control. This, these were being circulated by very well-known Black influencers. Um, the idea that the virus could be contained through the use of herbal remedies, this was another uh, line of uh, misinformation that was very potent in online Black communities. And then another one that is... Um, starting to creep back into public view, this idea that 5G radiation or 5G towers are the root cause of COVID-19. And what's important about understanding these individual case studies from our point of view um, as researchers is essentially that when you have this combination of unchecked influencers, unmoderated conspiracy, and unregulated information markets, that is like a uh, herbal remedies being something that you can advertise as a cure for COVID-19. And we did see as this, uh, these sets of conspiracies and misinformation came into view, that platform companies are willing to take action in some places, but not in others. And the actions were actually very uneven. They were very different across different platforms. Facebook would label things, Twitter would take them down, YouTube might label something or not. Uh, you know, people were actively re uploading things, right? So people were participating in this discourse. And basically, if anything got moderated, another set of people like were called into action to reanimate these claims. But the last point I want to make about all of this is that it's not just that there's going to be rumors and that they're going to circulate, that we're dealing with a problem of unmanageable scale, right? And this is something that our broadcast laws have tried to deal with in the past around instituting public interest obligations on radio. Basically, you know, you have a rock music station, WBCN, and you just want to play bangers all day long. You don't, you don't want to be sitting around talking about the weather or telling people the traffic update or saying there's a city council meeting later today. But those are public interest obligations and every radio station has to do them at some point during their, their broadcasts. And so we have to think about, well, what is the solution to this kind of scale problem? where small rumors or uh, misinformation uh, that is harmful, but maybe isn't going to reach that many people, how do we deal with it now um, that basically social media companies have introduced uh, this, this new kind of broadcast that allows you to reach so many people at once? And we're talking millions and millions of people being reached by uh, these kinds of narratives. 
And many of you have probably been exposed to them at some point and didn't realize it uh, or didn't realize that you were, you know, one of the many that were being exposed to it. And so uh, the last thing I'll say is uh, that I did write about the hydroxychloroquine narrative, uh, especially for nature very early on in the pandemic. And I'll also post that in the chat, um, which is to say that this is going to be an ongoing problem until we deal with it as a design issue. Uh, which means that we're not just dealing with changing people's attitudes or injecting truth or knowledge, but we actually have to think about, well, what are the fundamental issues that social media introduces around broadcast and take, take issue with them? And I think my eight minutes are up. I might be at 10 minutes now. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Donovan. I think you raise a, a, a lot of really critical issues, but a few things that really popped out to me here is the idea of misinformation at scale that we have entered a new world order. And I think particularly in the context that we are in right now, as vaccines are getting emergency youth use authorization. And in fact, today, the, uh, there's a special panel convening at the CDC to talk very clearly about outlining who should be first in terms of getting these vaccines. We cannot underestimate the impact that misinformation may have on this vaccine rollout. And particularly your point you made about targeting specific communities who are also at very high risk for COVID and the dangers that that inflicts upon these communities. And so I think there's a lot to unpack here, but a really um, important and critical um, start to our conversation. And thank you for sharing those links. I will um, next pass it along to Professor Benkler. Okay. Um, so this work uh, <clears throat> builds on five years of uh, large scale data analysis of millions of stories published online, tweets and Facebook shares since 2015 on the, Ameri on the American media ecosystem. Uh, initially, we studied the 2016 election using uh, network analysis, text analysis, and, quant and qualitative, data-guided qualitative analysis to understand the dynamics of communication around American politics. The critical stable finding is that um, the right-wing media is consistently an insular media ecosystem that links to itself, that is tweeted by the same people, that is Facebook shared by the same public Facebook pages, whereas everything from historically center-right publications like the Wall Street Journal to left publication like HuffPo or, or um, uh, Mother Jones are part of a distinctive single media ecosystem. It's not the right versus the left, but the right versus the rest. When we look at 2019, uh, when we look at 2019, we see the same structure of asymmetric polarization still here with mainstream media actually more important in the rest of the media ecosystem. And this becomes even clearer in the context of Twitter, which represents a supply side model. We see a highly separated right wing and the rest of the media ecosystem put together. Critically, when we do the same analysis for sharing of COVID-related stories, not politics-related stories, we see exactly the same structure. Here, the colors are based on 2019 political orientation, mix of audience, political mix of audience of the sites. And still you see the distinct right-wing system as opposed to an alternative uh, uh, mainstream Model. So we're seeing a politically inflected information system even on COVID. Specifically here, I'll talk about the structure of communication on the single most important piece of mis disinformation in the 2020 uh, election, which is mail-in voter fraud. We see it now clearly because that's the primary assertion about um, 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 uh, trying to undermine or overturn the election. Critically, what we see here is that Trump, when we created a synthetic Trump Twitter as though he were a media source, 
plays an absolutely central source in the media ecosystem, both in terms of the number, the amount of attention, the number of times he is linked to, and in the fact that he is well integrated into the mainstream and becomes a major source of news. And you see again, the right wing is here separately. When we look at Facebook, we see polarization, a lot of amateur stuff, but 81% of those link to outside media. And when we look at the outside media, what we see is it's the Murdoch publications and it's the Robert and Rebecca Mercer published publications that are the primary sources of disinformation on uh, mail-in ballots. When we look at the peaks of coverage, whether measured by open web stories, by tweets, by, or by Facebook posts, we then are able to go into every peak and say, what instigated the peak? What drove it? And what we see is that Donald Trump uses phone interviews on, uh, phone interviews on um, uh, Fox News, the daily COVID-19 press briefing, and his Twitter account. But his Twitter account isn't a social media campaign. It's essentially like a press release. It is covered directly by television stations, by radio, by mainstream media, because he's the president, because it's outrageous. It's a combination of covering the president because he's the president and covering outrageous statements because they are uh, uh, of the form of man bite dog. And so he harnesses traditional media to disseminate what he does by using an elite driven mass media centered strategy. And this is not the tweets of a madman. This is a consistent part of a campaign that is usually backed up by organs of the GOP, the RNC or various other sub organs by his campaign, uh, by his campaign staff and by other political and media elites on the right. So if we imagine that the standard story of infodemic is social media dominates, social media producers tell us stories that are crazy about hydroxychloroquine, about herbal remedies, et cetera, social media consumers believe them and that feeds a structure. One alternative is that mass media producers look at social media producers and the nonsense comes from social media influences mass media and goes to the side, social media leads and mass media follows. But in fact, what we're seeing here in American politics is that political and media elites are leading directly through mass media producers. And in the context of the 2020 election, and we found the same thing for 2016 election and throughout the last five years, social media follows and is secondary rather than central and many of the claims about Russians, about trolls, et cetera, depend on a mistaken view of where the origin of the most important disinformation that covers at scale, at population scale people. When you look at, uh, when you look at Pew surveys about who is getting their news, their primary source of news of political and election news, only 18% are social media. Network TV, local TV, websites and news apps, cable TV, mass media continues to be critically important. So now after the election, we're seeing a tension between Murdoch owned outlets during the daytime are trying to uh, stabilize. We're seeing the nighttime stories having elite GOP leaders saying the election was stolen on Hannity, the most popular news shows. And we're beginning to see pressure from Newsmax, OAN and Trump TV potential as a source of pressure on Fox News to remain loyal uh, uh, to the story. Now, we didn't plan on talking hydroxychloroquine, but there it is, I have it there anyway. Uh, what's interesting is that in the entire first two months, all references to hydroxychloroquine were health related and can be explained by specific papers or announcements by companies. Here, however, something quite different happens. What happens when we look here is a transition point around March 9th. The stock market crashes on March 9th and the political fallout becomes salient. The same week that the WHO announces the pandemic consensus of expert, Trump announces a national emergency. And what we see within the next five or six days is a mass of stories from Murdoch uh, publications in Australia, in, um, uh, uh, in the UK, replicated in the US, and most influentially, we see this uh, 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 pretend paper 
on uh, uh, Google Docs that's replicated and tweeted out by Elon Musk on March 16th. That evening, the uh, author of this nonsense goes on Laura Ingram. Uh, the next day, he goes on Tucker Carlson. And by the next morning, it's on Trump with the COVID. And this is where we see the uptake on left and right. So what we have is reckless elites, mass media tabloids, and partisan press. Most importantly, Fox. It's not the Russian or the Chinese. It's not crazy stuff on the style. What's driving it is motivated reasoning that is politically inflected, and it interacts with a media ecosystem whose business model is to offer ident political identity confirmation, not news. And just this morning, just this one last note, just this morning on Fox and Friends, for the first time, see here masks work, we see a very tentative, polite, story about Kansas and counties that did use masks and uh, counties that didn't. And we're beginning to see a little bit of a mass media effort to uh, 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 pull back on Fox, but they're subject to extremely powerful competitive pressures from Newsmax and OAN and the potential of Trump TV. So we're not talking about bad people necessarily. We're talking about a critically stable, for the last 35 or 40 years, market dynamic that serves identity confirmation. That creates the susceptibility to disinformation, and that's the primary vector of transmission of the most important beliefs about social distancing, about masks, about HCQ. Thanks. Well, thank you, um, Professor Bankler. <clears throat> that's really, those graphics are so profound. And I think, I think the one of the critical pieces I hear from what you're saying is, you know, I think a lot of us have presumed, um, perhaps mistakenly, that this has been an accelerated, and and there are components certainly that are accelerated under this current administration, but that this has been a consistent thread for a while, and your work obviously testifies to that, and the politicization of this. And, and really using this polarizing force that grows you know, ever larger in our country to basically provide information from multiple different sources that get then funneled into these central places where most people get it. And I think it's deeply profound and, and actually quite alarming to look at those figures. I feel like my breath gets taken away conceptualizing how challenging it might be for people to try to interpret based upon this kind of web of information out there or misinformation, what is accurate. So thank you for sharing that with us. And I think this leads perfectly into our final speaker, Professor Viswanathan, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. First, let me thank uh, Professor Brandt and uh, Professor Inkatz for inviting me. Uh, to spend the next few minutes with you in the class uh, 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 talking about this really uh, important topic. Um, and, 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 and to be uh, you know, on this panel, uh, I'm a huge admirer of the work of uh, Dr. Benkler and Dr. Donovan. So it's nice to be, have some kind of a halo effect you know, and reflect on their glory and their wonderful work. You know? so, uh, it's nice to be here. And to be very frank, I'm really jealous of the students. I went through the syllabus and what an extraordinary uh, class in the set of speakers you had. You know, so I wish I was in the class. You know, I, was, I wish I was on the other side uh, listening to all these speakers and, 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 and to professors Cards and Brandt. In fact, I used to tell my colleague, Gloria Sorensen, you know, when I grew up, I want to speak like Alan Brandt, you know, so, so someday maybe, you know, so. Uh, so it's great, great to be here. Um, I think uh, Professors Donovan and Benkler have actually covered a lot of ground. You know, uh, I, I'll just try to, uh, I don't have any PowerPoint slides. So I can create some if you want, if you are desperate about it, but I thought I would spare you uh, from them and, and just make a few points and leave uh, some time for uh, interaction or discussion, I think, right? So, uh, misinformation and disinformation are not new, right? Uh, you know, any, uh, I mean, uh, we always had misinformation. We, uh, misinformation is somewhat 
innocuous in many ways in the sense you know i have the wrong facts and that's perfectly reasonable you know i think you know um, you know sugary drinks are great for relaxation and uh, nothing to do with obesity and that's perfectly reasonable because that's what advertising tells me uh, unless somebody you know a scientist comes forward and publishes a paper and it's covered in the media to say no you know sugary drinks could lead to potentially obesity and other kinds of problems it's it's always been there and it's perfectly reasonable i think and disinformation itself again is not very new i mean you know we have always had uh, propaganda as as a way of of providing manipulating information uh, particularly the pre existing cognitive schema of people and use those co pre existing cognitive schema to 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 really uh, you know mislead uh, the public in a very deliberate way again that's nothing new so what is new here i think the particularly uh, in the context of covid 19 i think is is this notion of the way it is happening at scale that's what uh, dr donovan was talking about right so because you know because of social media uh um, uh you have you have whatever that is happening in some obscure corner of the internet becomes magnified and and that's what is worrying us right so uh, in in that context so there is um, you know if you look at the data about 50% of the global population right roughly between 3.5 billion people are so and the numbers vary a little bit here and there are on social media right so and and that's the reason we are all worried about it and 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 we are thinking about it right it is a particular challenge for science and how science is covered in social media now science as most of us know takes months years if not decades to develop right we build knowledge cumulatively uh, over time where we have a inbuilt falsification process so we publish a paper and somebody else publishes a paper 3 months down the road 3 years down the road to say that the findings are wrong there is a different uh, set of findings right so at one time we thought eggs are bad uh, we should not eat eggs because of the cholesterol problems and now we are saying no well the science is not very clear it could be fine right so that is perfectly fine that is the way science works but in the in the context of covid 19 just think about it everything is happening in a very compressed timeline right and everything is happening in a very public setting and that's what is creating problems because it is very quotidian normal to have scientific findings being contradicted but never in this kind of a public context in such of a compressed timeline context right so a paper is published last week and the findings can be disproved or falsified this week and that is what is creating problems you know from a social media perspective from a science you know development perspective knowledge is cumulative and we know much more about covid-19 than we knew say 10 months ago it's an amazing how much we have learned about this very new disease in 10 months people don't appreciate it because we are focusing so much on disinformation and misinformation but in fact you know science has been doing its job except that it is happening in a public context and that's one of the challenges in communicating science to the publics not just public there are publics out there that that how do you communicate a developing science an evolving science as it is changing almost every day right not just months or years almost every day when a new paper comes out i think that is creating a huge problems for us and so uh so what is the issue here why is it that it is becoming so public right and this is where i think dr benkler's hypothesis is extremely critical the way he laid it out you know so it is not you know we somehow because we all are on social media we assume that social media have this profound effect on people as i said somewhere you now this is like the proverbial uh, you know uh, pony and the horse manure story right you know there must be a pony somewhere because you know everybody is on social media but the fact of the matter is as he so rightly pointed out it is information disinformation misinformation being driven by real line real life groups not just offline right 
So what's happening is, whether it's a hydroxychloroquine story, which is a wonderful exemplar of this problem, or the 5G cell towers, or, or and a vaccine, the COVID-19 vaccine is going to inject you know, uh, these microchips so that they can uh, trace you. All these are not just emerging from social media, right? These are real life groups using social media. But what is happening as you showed clearly is, it's, it is actually real life groups publishing on social media. It would have lied in some obscure corner. In a non COVID context, that's where usually it lies, right? You can go back and look at a lot of examples. But in the COVID-19 context, in the hyper-partisan world, what is happening is it is picked up by other groups. And there is that reciprocal process between real life politicians and partisans and social media. And that reciprocal process is what we call as, you know, spiral of amplification, right? The real life groups publish something, social media amplified, then real life groups pick it up. So when somebody like Trump picks it up, the mainstream media have no choice but to cover it, right? Even if they know, even when they knew that this is false information, they have no choice because that's the role of the mainstream media, right? So that spiral of amplification is, is the reason where we are finding disinformation and misinformation is being mainstreamed, right? So whatever that used to lie in some obscure corner becomes mainstream because of this reciprocal process. So it's not just to blame only social media on this, right? And also that's, that's, it's very important to know that. Uh, second, uh, a second point I want to say uh, on this is the notion of inequality. So what does an ordinary person supposed to do, right? You know, in this world, right? So if, if you're a regular person on the street, fortunately, they are not on Twitter, right? You know? Because we are all on Twitter, we pay a lot of attention to Twitter, we analyze Twitter a lot and, and magnify its impact. But the fact of the matter is, if you talk to a regular person on the street, she or is not going to spend her time you know, tweeting, right? But the information ultimately percolates to them and they're worried about it. And this is what we learned. I think, what do I as a citizen need to do, right? And this is where evidence becomes important. And so let me say, uh, 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 talk about two issues in terms of data based on the survey we just completed. While 50% of the people uh, population roughly in theory are on social media, there is also good news. 50% are not on social media, right? You know, so that's, that's the good news. So what is the impact? When we did our analysis, we found social media don't matter. You know, about 35 to 40 percent of the people in our survey said they would not take the vaccine if it's available, right? But it's not because of social media. The relationship between social media and the and the vaccine uptake was a complete washout, right? Where are they going for their information? This goes back to what Dr. Benkler was saying. If you are, if you if you are mainstream source for information, if your source for information for COVID-19 is right-wing media, Fox News, Breitbart News, you are two to three times more likely to say you will not take the vaccine. If your major source of information on COVID-19 is mainstream media, in quotations, like right? New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Washington Post, you are one or two more times, odds ratios, are likely to say you will take the vaccine, right? It is your source of information that matters. A second important factor, party identification. If you identify yourself as a Republican, you are much less likely to say, I will take the vaccine. If you identify yourself as an independent or a Democrat, you are much more likely to say vaccine. If you trust scientists, if you score high on trusting scientists and researchers, you're much more likely to accept vaccines than otherwise. Last, if you perceive the risk to be high, you're much more likely to take the vaccine than if you perceive the risk to be low, right? So there is good news for us here. It's not all doom and gloom, right? There are things we can do, I think. 
So we have to look at the empirical. I'm not suggesting, by the way, that social media don't matter. Please don't misunderstand me, right? I'm saying we need to take a more nuanced look at how these effects occur. And that's why it was so nice to follow uh, Dr. Donovan and Beckler because they have laid the table for me, so to speak, I think, you know, the way they have laid it out, right? Then the last point I want to make, and I, I'll keep quiet after this, just like money or wealth or health, information is also unequally divided. There are communication inequalities. What we mean by that is different social groups and different individuals have differential ability, capability to access information, to process information, and to use and act on information. And this is what we call as communication inequalities. And that's one of the significant worries for us just like people are worried about health disparities and health inequalities, we are worried about communication inequalities because not everybody has access to information that they can use. And this is what worried us when we started working with our community partners and we do a lot of community engaged research. We have been hearing a lot from them. You know, I mean, it is a national embarrassment for us that not until April, we documented that there are that COVID-19 is affecting different groups differently. Think about it. It took us four months to recognize that. How embarrassing is it? It's a shame, right? It's a disgrace. So many people who are underserved, who are minorities have died and suffered because we have not been able to document this early on, even though we know from social epidemiology literature that this is likely to happen. So when we started hearing from our community partners, we, we thought about it and said, what do you need in your day-to-day -day life? You don't read, to new, read New England Journal of Medicine or JAMA every day and chase down every new finding. That's not what you need. What you need is what do you need to make your decision today about COVID-19? And that's the reason what uh, we created this dashboard that Professor Kads uh, mentioned. I'll be happy to put the link up. And what we did in the dashboard is we said, you don't have to go through all journals. We will do that for you. We will synthesize these findings for you. What is necessary for you today, right? So we have some myths versus facts. We have some frequently asked questions. We have some data. We have some tips on well-being, et cetera. And, and we said, you can go to two or three sources. You don't have to go all over CDC or WHO, uh, wherever you want to go, a couple of sources and just get the information you need today so that our, this is our effort to minimize those disparities or inequalities among people. And this is used by our community groups who work with their clientele and distribute this information. Not that they are always on the web or internet. A lot of our partners are not in there, but our partners are, our people are not. So our partners print out this information and share it with them, right? And, and what it does is, you know, and we change this information, we update it frequently. And we have now this information uh, in, in, in English, obviously, Spanish, Portuguese, because we have a lot of immigrants in Hindi. Uh, and because I think, you know, it's very critical to reach out uh, to these groups with this kind of information. And hopefully it's an effort to bridge these gaps, think, you know. So what I want to say is, I think, you know, uh, we need to go by evidence, you know, what is the evidence we have and, and use that evidence, you know, in a way to really transcend this, uh, this really this miasma of misinformation and disinformation out there. Uh, all hope is not lost. Uh, I think, as I said, you know, there are ways we can do things, there are things we can do. What we should not do is blame or put the responsibility on individuals and say, thou shall not forward a false message. I think that is unfair to the individuals. If we are really want to make some decisions, it's the platform's responsibility. They have the computational resources. They have other resources. It is their job to do that. Don't let us blame individuals. We are blaming the victims if we put the responsibility on individuals, you know, because it's very difficult. It's, it's just, you know, people are finger happy. So. Uh, the, let me stop here uh, and, and, and just open it up for questions. Thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you so much. Um, these were really three remarkable presentations. They fit together better than Ingrid and I could have imagined. <clears throat> I guess maybe I'll start with a question for all three of you, if that's okay, and then we'll get some 
<clears throat> excuse me, then we'll get some students up to ask you as well. But there seems to be, you know, one of the one of the premises of the course is that pandemics will reveal social, political, scientific phenomena, inequalities in particular, fault lines of society. And it seems to me in many ways we could conclude that the pandemic has opened up a window on a communications and knowledge system that is severely flawed, problematic and threatening, perhaps we could say really threatening to democracy. And so there are strategies kind of within COVID-19, how are we going to effectively communicate um, rational, scientific, evidence-based information. But all three of your presentations really raise a much larger question about the future of being able to deal with pandemics, um, the future of, you know, social policies that reduce inequalities, um, as well as the sort of stability of our polity writ large. So I'm wondering, as you're looking at this, and one of the ways I think about it is that the pandemic has opened up to me sort of how highly disastrous this communications and information system is. What are the sort of steps back? Like, is this one of those instances where we can really use these observations now to begin to think about effective scientific literacy, regulation of certain types of social media? Is the answer in terms of more intensive regulation or is the answer in some ways in terms of community-based information? So I'm wondering, you know, in terms of, we've talked a lot about mitigating COVID-19, but if you were going to mitigate this information ecosystem, that is so highly problematic and so potentially harmful. How, how would we begin to address that? I have a few ideas. <laughs> um, so uh, when Professor Viswanath was talking, I was thinking about Eleanor Ostrom's work on um, the ways in which we govern our inf our information commons, right? The the idea that we have to govern the commons a little bit differently now, given that Silicon Valley companies have taken up so much of the space in terms of deciding, uh, however reluctantly, what uh, kinds of information is going to be seen by the public. Uh, based on the ways in which they structure their algorithms and their, you know, recommendation systems. And so social media, as, um, uh, you know, Professor Bankler's work points out, is, is a piece of the problem. But really what we're dealing with is a kind of power that is very familiar, which is a, a political elites, uh, when left unchecked and don't have to follow the kind of gatekeepers maybe that they had to follow in the past with, um, you know, issuing a press release and then that press release gets taken up by the press, you know, social media has introduced this kind of circumvention that we hadn't really seen politicians utilize uh, in the way that they did most recently. And so when we talk about like information governance, though, lots of uh, people, our own politicians and, you know, elected representatives are going to step back and say, nope, we're not going to touch that. We don't deal in information. We, uh, you know, govern. Um, and this is some of the, the things that I've heard in, you know, being in conversation with um, congressional representatives is they don't want to touch Section 230. They don't want to touch social media or the internet in terms of information governance. But I think there's two things that need to happen if we're going to get where we need to be, which is none of these systems were designed, especially social media, to deliver any kind of knowledge or truth, right? What you have is a system that Ethan Zuckerman years ago basically told us was about really about cat pictures. And if, you know, picture, if people were comfortable sharing pictures of their house and their cats, then um, some limited political activity could play out there. But for the most part, it's not 
set up to raise critical uh, knowledge to the forefront. Uh, you know, critical is in the kind of knowledge that we need in order to assess our risks in our daily lives. And then when you add in the politicization of certain elements of science and medicine, particularly a kind of miracle cure that's always been here, right? Something that we've been through and, and if we could just get everybody hydroxychloroquine, the, the harm would be uh, lessened. And, um, you know, Ashish Jha found this out very clearly what the uses of Congress can be uh, when you can assemble people who are going to uh, kind of make that argument because their political end is what they're hiding, which is that they just want the economy uh, to get revved back up um, in order to, uh, you know, placate the constituents, you know. And, and one of the issues, I think, is that the governance of people is really hard because once you start doing that kind of governance, like saying, you know, you can't carry on with your daily routine, um, you're no longer a politician in that sense. Like people hate you. Like, I, I hate this, right? It's, you know, but at the same time, we have to manage it. And But I think the role of information is critical here because we don't have a system to deliver what I think are the four key elements here, which is timely, local, relevant, and accurate information. And social media is not designed for that. And so if we are going to reverse engineer or redesign for it, I've made the argument in an MIT tech review piece that we might need to rethink targeted advertising and say, you've built out these algorithms for targeted advertising. Now, how do we deliver public health messaging using them for free? The other thing is that I've written about in Scientific American is that we have no distribution plan uh, for the truth. And so we need content curation on the front end of algorithms. It can't just be that, um, algorithms surface what is quote unquote fresh and relevant, which is also what's popular, uh, because that is very gameable. <laughs> and, you know, Yokai's work shows this as well as others, is that uh, when an algorithm is, is kind of set to run, uh, people do invest incredible amounts of time and money in, in engineering it so that their information will come up first. And so I think unless we have these things in place and we have content moderation, uh, in a way that is consistent across platforms, we're going to keep reliving this problem of not having a clear design for the for accurate information online. And so that's where my mind goes, which is less about uh, regulation, only in the last instance where we continue to see this this problem play out of political elites utilizing social media and um, other conduits of information to spread, uh, you know, essentially what is their political ideology rather than the, the facts of the matter. Other thoughts about this? Go ahead, you uh, <clears throat> I know I do my research with a lot of data from the net, but I think it's really important to understand that the uh, crisis of democratic societies is not fundamentally about social media, not fundamentally about information systems. It's about political economy. When the 1929 crash did what it did to the world economy, radio was the plenty good enough uh, new technology that allowed for the rise of fascism. And that supported Father Coughlin in the US and obviously fascism in Europe. Um, when you talk about inequality, Ronald Reagan talks about the welfare queen to racialize the, the welfare system in order to undermine trust in social uh, uh, insurance. Uh, when he says the nine no scariest word in the English language is I'm from the government and I'm here to help, that's a fundamental assault on the possibility of rational democratic policy for the common good. When, uh, when um, uh, George H.W. Bush runs on Willie Horton and Richard Nixon has a law, a, a war on, 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 on crime, a war on drugs. You're racializing again the entire structure of the role of government. So 
that's where the origins of the political identity that created the market dynamic that fed Rush Limbaugh in 1988 and the Christian Broadcast Network in 86, that fed Fox News in 96, the internet is just wrapping itself around it. The crisis is a global crisis following the Great Recession and the collapse of the economic system that was put in place in the 70s. It creates enormous insecurity. It creates enormous identity threat for millions of people. And politicians and media moguls take advantage to make money and get power from it. It's really important not to get entangled with the specifics of a communication system when the crisis is structural in the political economy. Um, yeah, just just a couple of points. I think uh, you are the historian here, Professor Brandt. So you know you know this. This is nothing new, right? I mean, we have always had. I think uh, you have pointed out the example around uh, uh, you know radio and its propaganda uh, power. So we always had these issues. I think you know, uh, and and I think you know we blame the information systems, uh, but but I think that the problem lies with the information system, but it's actually outside the information system where the information system is being used or manipulated to the, for powerful political ends, I think, you know? And it, I, I think it's absolutely right. I think, you know, it, it is, even though I'm not a Luddite, I like social media as, as much as anyone, internet as, as much as anyone, but we have to look at the data. We have to look at, at, at the evidence. And, and clearly there is a crisis. There's a crisis of governance all over the world. There's a crisis of equity issues, inequalities. Uh, and the populism is not driven just by social media, right? Populism is out there, uh, you know, in, even in countries where social media are not very prevalent, I think. I, I'm not saying social media are not playing a role in this. Absolutely they are. But it is really a larger crisis we are facing in terms of governance and political ideology and partisanship, not just Republican versus Democrat, you know, uh, around issues of equity globally. And, and I think, you know, and, 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 and I think uh, certainly uh, the kind of a current information system we have are contributors, you know, major contributors and some of the drivers. And to me, the solution then is again, as I keep saying, we can teach all the scientific literacy we want, right? But at the end of the day, we are still expecting individuals and the goodness of their heart to act rationally, you know. I'm not a cynic. I'm a skeptic, but not a cynic in my life, right? I'm not saying that individuals don't act rationally. I'm saying, but I think we are putting too much onus on individuals. If you want to do something, we put the responsibility squarely on these platforms, you know. Uh, just as we have done with broadcast systems historically, with newspapers historically, even, even after the First Amendment, you know, there were limits. Lerner Hand and others have written, written very well about this. So my argument is if we want to do this, you know, it is the platforms that we should tackle and not just think of teaching literacy of some kind to the people, I think. You know, I mean it works, but it's not really scalable in any way. And I, I do think, and I cannot repeat this until people are sick and tired of me saying it all the time. Equity is the heart of this. Racism is at the heart of this. If you look at what uh, Professor Donovan showed, right, on the blacks being uh, targeted, it's at, they're already manipulating the pre-existing historical schema, right? If you look at the data, uh, you know, in our survey clearly showed African Americans are less likely to take up the vaccine because we have a sorry, sorry history with science and African Americans, with science and Native Americans. We can't ever outlive that, right? No amount of social media, no social media doesn't matter when we have the poor history and, and we have to really compensate for that. These are such important points. <clears throat> I guess one of my questions is I see these deep historical continuities, but then I find myself thinking that something different has actually happened and that the velocity of the communications, and if I could take Professor Benkler's networking map of information back 50 years or 100 years, it would be very spare compared to this density and velocity and pace of the way we communicate now. And I sometimes do have this idea when I'm talking to 
people who disagree with me so radically. And, and I realize that they've been listening and thinking in such a, you know, insular place. And it's, and it's very strategic, you know, I forget which one of you used the term tricking people to believe. And so I wonder if there's some deeper psychological dimension to the political economic forces that have produced this that are that make me so alarmed by by the current moment. But you know, there there are reasons also to believe that if we do identify these things as fundamental to inequality or fundamental to political economy or large capital interests, then we can figure out ways to to address them. Let's get some students on. I'm sorry to 